This week's parasha is Parsha Tzav. Uh, that's the second parasha in, uh, in Chumash Vikra. And I think it's time to talk about Korbanot. So this shir is going to be based on a shir I heard from Rav Bernstein on his website, Journeys in Torah. Okay, so let's start in this week's parasha, the most appropriate place to start. This is Vayikra, chapter 6, verse 2. So, Tzavit Aaron vet banav lemor. Zot Torah haola. So we'll stop there in the Pasuk. So command Aaron and his sons to say, This is the Torah of the Ola. This is the law of the burnt offering. And the Pesach goes on, but uh, we'll just go straight into Rashi. So Rashi says, first, his, uh, the reason why Rashi comments on Savit Aaron is because he's wondering, why doesn't the Torah just tell us, Emor el Aaron, say to Aaron. After all, we know that if God tells you to do something, then let's generally command it. Whatever God says, you should do. So why does the Torah go out of its way to say, Tzavit Aaron, command Aaron? So it says Rashi, Ein Tzav el Lashon Zeros. There's no Tzav means a Lashon of, uh, of activating and, uh, and energizing, um, of encouraging, encouraging you to do this. Miyad Viladoros. Immediately and for future generations. And that's very specific. Well, why does Rashi need to say all this? After all, so firstly, um, we understand we understand that, like, doing something, you should do something with great energy. And moreover, I mean, especially when it's a mitzvah, and moreover, when it says, Miyad v'latorot, obviously our understanding is that, in general, this, by the way, these are questions that the Mepharshim ask, that whenever we see Miyad v'latorot, you should think, I mean, that's true of all mitzvahs. In fact, the Rambam says, in order to codify a mitzvah as one of the 613 mitzvahs, it's to be applicable for the future. That is to say, in the desert, in the, when we were in the desert for 40 years, uh, the Jews were, were told, go collect the man in the morning, right? So maybe you could say that that's a mitzvah of Tariyag. After all, God said, go collect the man. So maybe we could say that that's one of the 613 mitzvahs. And the Rambam says, no, because that was only valid in the desert. It's not valid now, or once they entered Eretz Yisrael. And therefore, because it wasn't a mitzvah forever, it's not codified as one, one of the 613. So we understand that if we have one of the mitzvahs that's codified in the 613, then obviously it's miyad of Ladorot. It's immediately and for all generations. So what's Rashi trying to say? Our answer, uh, provided by Rav Bernstein, is in the, the Sefer, Mayanot Beit HaShoeva, by Rabbi Shimon Schwab, who, uh, who served the Washington Heights community in Manhattan near uh, Yeshiva University. So he says the following. The world of Korban, Kar Korbanot is a, is a very specific world. That is to say, uh, the bringing of the Korban is not enough. It has a lot of details and a lot of specifications, but it's meant to be accompanied by appropriate thoughts and appropriate uh, resolutions. If, uh, if the act of, the, of bringing a korban substitutes uh, for the change of a person, that is to say, a person brings a korban and refuses to change, then we have a really deep problem, and the, bringing a korban can actually be a negative pursuit. Um, but we see that in many generations, particularly in the first, uh, the first temple period, there was much emphasis on bringing the korban perfectly, uh, and little to no emphasis I'm really changing uh, as a person. Now the Maase Hashem uh, comments on something very interesting, that whenever we bring a korban, it's actually described in the Torah as a reach nechoach, a pleasing aroma. Now we have to understand that sometimes these korban were actually not so pleasing to smell. So why does the Torah keep calling it a reach nechoach? The Maase Hashem explains that generally whenever you have a, something you're anticipating, right? like let's say a wonderful meal, or a really nice cool drink, or a hot drink, the first thing you do is you generally smell it first, and that smell is helps you anticipate the more substantial effect that you're about to come, the more substantial pleasure that you're about to experience. So, so too with the korban. We offer a korban, and that's pleasing to God because that's supposed to reflect our, uh, a, the person's resolution to change and to be a better person. So, our quest, so bringing a defective korban is a problem in terms of bringing a perfect korban, but that's not accompanied by the similar or appropriate thoughts is an issue. And we actually see this uh, in two different sources, at least. So in Yeshaya, in, a, in a Shabbat Chazon, we read in Yeshaya that he said that the Navi is quoted as saying, Lama ri, li, rav They say, God is asking the Jewish people, what do we need all your korban for? And then he continues to say, like, look, I'm seated with all your korban, you've brought enough, but I want you to change, I want you to change. That's where the emphasis lies. I don't want any of your korban, I've had enough of them. I want you to change, I want you to be better. So that's, uh, that's one. And then a little more recently, in, uh, in uh, Parshat Zachor, in the Haftarah for Parshat Zachor, that is to say the Shabbat right before Purim, just a few weeks ago, 
We had a case of Shmuel Hanavi, who came out to see that Shaul, who's commanded to wipe out Amalek, including their animals, comes back with some of their animals. And when Shmuel says, well, what is this? Shaul then responds, oh, it's okay, I brought these animals so I could sacrifice them for Hashem. Which is a bit of a tricky situation, because Shmuel then says, and this is in uh, Shmuel 1, chapter 15, verse 22. I'm just going to read it in English. So Samuel said, Does Hashem take delight in elevation offerings and feast offerings, as in obedience to the voice of Hashem? Behold, obedience is better than a choice offering, attentiveness than the fat of rams. So Shmuel is clearly saying, look, look, the whole point of bringing a korban is because you didn't listen to God. So you bringing a korban is supposed to uh, emphasize the fact that you will not listen to God. You disobeying God so that you could bring a korban is deeply ironic and problematic. So what are you doing? So that's, uh, that's how we, I guess, we end the first temple period. But then we have this period for 70 years, aka when the Purim story occurred, uh, when there were no korban because there was no temple. Then the Jewish people return, rebuild the second temple, and now we see a criticism of the Navi Malachi, again when it comes to Korbanot, but now the criticism is a little bit different. He says, uh, I don't have it in Hebrew, but it says, and you'll bring a, a, a blind Korban, Einra, there's nothing wrong with that, and you'll bring a lame animal, sickly animals, Einra, you'll just keep bringing all these defective animals, and that's not bad. And then uh, the Navi asks, would you bring this to an official, to a government official? Would he be satisfied with that? Would he favor you with these terrible animals? So what are you doing? Bringing them to God. Now, kind of an interesting situation because in the second Beit HaMikdash, it seems like we were bringing defective korbanot, as in the animal itself was a problem. Now, where is that coming from? So Rabbi Shimon Schwab says, that's because it seems that the pendulum has swung. That is to say, in the first temple, we were bringing great korbanot with no kavana. Now, the Jews were so deeply impacted by that, and we said, well, clearly it's the thought that counts, right? The act, the act doesn't really matter. It's the thought really that, that matters. Um, so the Jewish people moved from any emphasis on what the korban looked like, right? Uh, because they figured that, look, it doesn't matter to God. He doesn't care. I mean, I would care. I don't want a, an animal like that in my flock, but he certainly doesn't. So give him those. After all, he, he's telling me that the korban doesn't matter. He just wants me to be a better person. So what does it matter how I bring the korban? Um, and the, the Navi Malachi says, that too is a mistake. The two need to be balanced. So we see this emphasis on, like, look, the action needs to be a good action. You can't forget that. That was what the first generation in the first temple, they got right. And what the, second, uh, what the people in the second temple got wrong. They said there's no emphasis on the action. And the, the, the criticism of the, of, the, of the Navi Malachi was, no, the action matters. But it's not only the action that matters, but there also needs to be a thought, your genuine desire to change that should also accompany it. So we see that's why uh, that's why there's this special zeros in the Korbanot. That's to say, in Thav Eloshon zeros, there needs to be a certain like activation and, and encouraging when it comes to Korbanot. Miyad, immediately, because we saw that that was an immediate problem with, in terms of their thoughts, but the Villadoros, because maybe later on we might get the thought correct, we won't get the action correct, and both two are non-negotiable and are required, and we see this lesson come out through the lesson of the Korbanot. Shabbat Shalom.